Welcome, everybody. Nice to see you. My name is Brock Smith, and I'm the area champion for entrepreneurship at the Gustafson School of Business at the University of Victoria. I thought we would start by uh, sharing UVic territory acknowledgement. And I encourage all of you to take a moment to consider where you are currently located and the relationships of Indigenous peoples with this land. At UVic, we acknowledge and respect the Lekwungen peoples on whose traditional territory the university stands and the Songhe, the Squamalt, and Wasanic peoples uh, whose historical relationships to the land continue to this day. Uh, Jeff Bray, the executive director of the Downtown Victoria Business Association, and I are co-hosting this session. Jeff's going to start off by giving us a recap of where we've been with the COVID crisis, where we are today, and what he, a little bit about what he expects for the future. Then I'm going to share briefly some insights of a study that I'm leading on strategic response to the crisis. Uh, if you have any um, comments, they can go in the chat. If you have questions to the panel, they go in the Q&A. We'll take a look at the questions after each of us has done our short presentation, and there'll be lots of time at the end for, for Q&A. So I'm going to turn things over to Jeff. Great. Well, thank you very much, Brock. And uh, certainly, I want to uh, welcome everyone who's joining on for the webinar and want to thank uh, the Gustafson School of Business for inviting me to come and talk a little bit about uh, downtown and uh, the pandemic and the response. Um, I am going to uh, do a short presentation. Um, I always find it's easier to look at uh, 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 a PowerPoint than just looking at my, my head talking. So I thought we would talk, um, I would present briefly on sort of downtown Victoria recoveries, uh, finales and rescues. And for those that don't know, I'm the executive director of the Downtown Victoria Business Association. We are essentially a business improvement association. Uh, we're made up of the businesses uh, in our boundaries uh, and we're funded by a special property tax levy on the property owners within our boundaries, which are essentially Blanchard Street to uh, Superior or Belleville on the south and uh, Chatham Discovery on the north and the waterfront. So we have the main core of downtown. Uh, and we focus on uh, some key uh, activities around placemaking and promotion for downtown. Uh, so we have our clean team, uh, which for those of you who come downtown have probably seen them. Uh, they do a tremendous job of augmenting the city's work for keeping the uh, sidewalks uh, clean. Uh, they also remove uh, uh, tags and graffiti. Uh, they did uh, almost 15,000 tag removals last year alone. So they make a tremendously positive impact on the appearance of downtown. Uh, we also um, host many events uh, ourselves to create some vibrancy and, and activity downtown. Uh, last December, we had the Lights of Wonder in Centennial Square. Uh, we've also uh, put on the Buskers Festival the last several years. Uh, we are also one of the uh, founding co-partners for the Capital City Comic Con. And the idea with events is really just to bring people into downtown and, and create some energy and then obviously hopefully have people visit our businesses. Uh, we also uh, do a lot of marketing in the promotion of downtown as a destination. Uh, we focus primarily on people from Souk to Sydney, um, but really we are the chief marketing arm for our businesses in downtown. And then finally, we do a fair amount of advocacy, uh, primarily with the city and secondarily with the province on issues that impact uh, businesses and in particular small and medium sized enterprises um, who uh, are not necessarily aligned with uh, industry uh, associations or others that can represent them. And so we assume that role. So obviously, uh, it doesn't need to be said that uh, the onset of the pandemic was um, really quite unprecedented and, and really quite shocking uh, in terms of how immediate the impact was. And, you know, essentially, we saw here in downtown um, things change overnight to where businesses were closed up, offices were closed up. People, uh, uh, you know, adhered to the prime minister's um, request that people stay at home. And so it became literally a ghost town uh, overnight. And the first several weeks um, was really quite, quite troublesome in terms of what the future uh, was, um, what was going to happen for businesses. 
And uh, as we started the reopening phase, we at the uh, DBBA did a, um, uh, a video just to try to sort of help people understand um, the, the impacts and remind people that businesses were here and that uh, it would be great if people came back downtown. Uh, and so this gives a sense of what downtown was like way back at the beginning. I know what you're thinking. It feels a little eerie, like the scene out of a movie, the quiet streets, the signs. People use words like difficult, uncertain. Just months ago, downtown was full of life. And now? We've had to make difficult choices. Say goodbye to staff that feel like family. But through it all, downtown has been resilient. We're innovating. We're finding new ways to reach our customers. We're adapting to ensure our customers are safe. And we're finding ways to be generous. Because when we get back, our entire community becomes stronger. They're finding new ways to support local business. Buying gift cards. Ordering takeout. Shopping local online. Investing in our economy. Supporting local like never before. Sure. Downtown has been quiet. But the love has never left. And now, downtown is looking a bit brighter. Slowly but surely, we're beginning to reopen our doors. We're we hiring staff and welcoming back to major places. The new normal is constantly changing. And we're constantly adapting. We're listening to the health authorities and working hard to keep you safe. It may look a little bit different, but the feeling is still the same. Downtown Victoria is a place for connection and commerce. Where relationships are built and memories are made. I want to thank you for the years of support. Thank you for buying the game. For staying home and reading. For continuing to drink our beer. Thank you, Victoria, for continuing to support your local businesses. So sorry about that. Um, so that video just shows what it was like in the early days and weeks of the pandemic in terms of small and medium sized businesses. And uh, for many, uh, they closed because there were no people downtown. For others like restaurants and personal services, they were actually ordered to close. And so you can imagine what it'd be like to a small, to be a small or medium sized enterprise and get an order saying you have to close your doors, let your staff go. And by the way, we have no idea when this will end. And so uncertainty um, was really the prevailing mood uh, for all of these businesses. Then we also had the, the fact that and many, you know, may recall this, that every day there was a new press conference. Uh, there was new news. There were new programs that were being announced. There were new ideas about COVID and how it was spread. Um, and for many small and medium-sized businesses in particular, uh, those, those folks struggled to manage all of this information and to sort of understand, you know, what programs do they qualify in? And what are the evolving protocols? And, and what does flatten the curve mean for me as a business operator who still has rent to pay and trying to keep my staff going. I've got bills from my suppliers. So, you know, all this information was, was really almost overwhelming. And on top of that, the timing of COVID really impacted businesses. And again, particularly small and medium sized retail where they had used, you know, their normal existing lines of credit to bring up their inventory for, for spring and summer. Uh, and so they were already fully leveraged uh, expecting their normal summer business and boom, uh, this all hit. So it really created uh, a challenge for, for small and medium sized businesses. 
So when the province announced their reopening, there was obviously great excitement and businesses were, were eager to reopen. Um, you know, some had pivoted to online and, and takeout and delivery. Others had been doing curbside um, pickup all the way through. And some actually had closed and were now actually physically reopening. And initially, uh, for many, there was pent up demand out in the public. And so they did see uh, their regular customers who had been waiting come back in. They did see uh, lineups for haircuts and, and some of those personal services. And so initially there was that, that uh, first run, uh, rush. But right away they started to find, some of the businesses started to find challenges in rehiring staff that uh, perhaps were making minimum or near minimum wage and were receiving a check every month from the government to not go to work uh, rehiring became a bit of a challenge. Um, for those that are uh, related to tourism, uh, domestic and BC regional tourism is really only 20% of the overall tourism market for, for Victoria. So the tourism numbers were extremely low uh, and certainly many businesses uh, saw this through their sales and, and their, uh, their traffic and obviously hotels uh, and the restaurants and food and beverage within those hotels saw this. Um, on the bright side, uh, the expanded patios and flex spaces that the uh, city allowed for with a very easy permit process combined with the provincial government's relaxing of several of the liquor regulations around capacity and expanded patios uh, were very successful uh, and were very um, popular with the public uh, and were welcomed by businesses. It was actually seen as a, as a real breath of fresh air. And, and in many ways, we've seen an emergence of patio culture uh, that I think may be a, a bit of a permanent holdover uh, once we get past uh, phase three and are into phase four. Um, one of the things though that was not anticipated as we were going through the spring was the uh, sort of lack of office workers coming back into their offices downtown. Uh, even as we're doing this webinar, most buildings are operating under 30%. Uh, and the business model for many retailers, especially who rely on the lunch trade, that's not going to be sufficient long term. If you think of it in terms of shopping local, for our businesses downtown, the office workers are the local economy. And so with them being at home, uh, it's, it's quite the challenge. Uh, so we've really had to recognize that promoting downtown as a regional destination um, was going to be much more critical because um, the idea of shopping local has really been embraced by Greater Victorians. But if I'm working from home in Langford or Gordon Head or North Saanich, I am shopping local. So I'm actually fulfilling that call to action. But for our businesses downtown, it requires that extra step of coming downtown. So we've gotten a little bit edgy and a little bit uh, uh, catchy to try to differentiate ourselves in terms of our, um, uh, our work downtown. And I am going to... Had a tough day at the office. Tired of being a wannabe chef. Don't have a cow. Have a great meal in downtown Victoria. There are so many restaurants to choose. Sorry, folks, I have to... Uh, Get that one back here. There we go. Had a tough day at the office. Tired of being a wannabe chef. Don't have a cow. Have a great meal in downtown Victoria. There are so many restaurants to choose from, no matter what you're in the mood for. Your TV dinner never stood a chance. Eat my shorts. More like eat all sorts of great meals. Until next time, stay safe and see you downtown. Had a tough day at the office. So that was an example of something that was a little bit edgy to just try to try to encourage people to make that extra step. Uh, to come downtown, you know, we're, we're looking at a particular cohort of the public to, to come downtown and enjoy it. Uh, certainly the summer weather was helpful. Uh, 
uh, but we'll have to be doing a new campaign as we get into the fall. So finally, I just wanted to identify uh, some of the continuing challenges that we see in particular in downtown. Um, the lack of office workers and especially the public sector workers being back downtown is, is a real challenge. Uh, street crime and street disorder uh, really are impacting uh, business uh, and uh, impacting the sort of perception of downtown as being safe and welcoming for the public. Um, you know, changing health uh, orders, such as closing liquor scales at 10 p.m., hamper even medium-term planning for businesses. If you have only so much capacity because of physical distancing, you can uh, staff up and inventory up for a certain amount of business, then all of a sudden an order comes in and now limits that even further. Uh, it becomes hard to, to know how to schedule and, and manage uh, your staff and your inventory. The other thing that's really emerged for many small and medium-sized businesses is uh, supply chain uh, and the ability to um, uh, inventory up uh, in their normal process, in their normal timelines in terms of getting deliveries. So when customers show up to Capital Iron or wherever it is they like to shop and they don't have that in that particular item in stock, uh, people tend to then go to Amazon. And so even though they want to shop local, the inventory is having a challenge getting here. And so that diverts people to the large online presences. Um, the other thing is that there is data that suggests uh, that suburban retail and restaurants have not been as badly impacted by COVID as urban core businesses. Uh, obviously, again, lots of people working from home. We had kids home throughout the spring. So people shopped closer to home, they dined out or did take out closer to home. Um, and so we've seen a bit of a divide between the urban core um, in Greater Victoria and the suburban uh, area. And that's been reflected in Vancouver, Toronto, Montreal as well. Uh, and then finally, you know, we have the changing weather and, and darkness that may impact, you know, uh, further people's sort of willingness to either come downtown or stand outside a business uh, in the rain in order to uh, maintain social distancing. So how we adapt and businesses adapt and pivot to that new reality uh, is going to be critical as well. Um, so what's needed? Uh, well, we really need office workers back to at least 65% on a daily basis. I mean, they may rotate, they may have alternate days, but we need a significant number back. Uh, the patio, patios and flex spaces need to be extended throughout the winter. There's a report going to council this Thursday. Uh, we would like them extended through till next October to match the provincial regulations. Um, but businesses need some certainty that they can stay there for a while in order to invest in the cost to winterize those spaces. Uh, the commercial rental program by the federal government needs to be modified and continued, and it needs to allow individual businesses to apply. It has not been a very uh, well subscribed program because the emphasis is entirely on the property owners, the landlords to apply for a benefit that really is for the benefit of small and medium sized businesses. We need a complete ban on camping in the downtown core encampments uh, do not engender safety uh, to the public. Uh, and we need everything uh, to make sure people are welcome downtown. And we need, you know, uh, greater Victorians to continue to make those purposeful shopping and buying decisions to support the downtown businesses. So that is my presentation, Brock. Thanks, Jeff. Um, so rather than fielding uh, questions to Jeff at this time, I'm going to take about eight minutes to tell you a little bit about a research project that I'm leading, and then we'll open it up generally to questions for, for either of us. And Jeff has you know, nicely outlined the challenges that we have, you know, entrepreneurs have faced. And you know, what's interesting, I think, about this is everybody's COVID-19 experience has been very different. You know, a few businesses have had their very best revenues ever, while many others have been absolutely devastated. And you know, as an academic, I'm interested in knowing what we might collectively learn from this crisis so that we can be more resilient for the next one. So I thought I'd share some initial findings of a study that I'm doing along with my wife, Claudia, who's also a Gustafson professor and our colleague, Jan Keitzman. To date, we've interviewed about 16 local entrepreneurs about their strategic response to the crisis. And we hope to interview about a dozen more. 
And so far, uh, we've observed five different responses to this crisis. And I'm just going to share my screen here just to uh, show you those. Hopefully, you can see that now. And you know the first the first response that we saw was you know was people just closing down their businesses permanently and and so they you know they chose to exit. Others chose to wait it out. They closed down temporarily. Either they were forced to or they chose to, as as Jeff outlined. We saw businesses that we described as staying the course, maintaining their business operations while adopting new WorkSafe and health guidelines putting up plexiglass barriers and that type of thing. Um, we saw businesses that adapted through incremental, uh, incremental innovation. Uh, they modified their business model, such as bricks and mortar stores taking their businesses online. And then finally, we saw companies that sort of reinvented themselves. They developed a new business model, new product lines, or other such reinventions, such as distilleries making hand sanitizer. And I'm, I'm interested in the res what the response of our audience was. And I am, you know, hopefully there's some entrepreneurs uh, here. And I'm just gonna, looks like I'm gonna have to stop sharing my screen just for a second to be able to get my poll function. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna uh, put up a, uh, a poll. And where is it gone? Well, oh, here we go, there are polls. And launch polling. So what was your business's response to COVID? Did you exit, wait it out, stay the course, adapt, reinvent, or other? And if if you uh, if you didn't have a business, then uh, you can choose other or 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 stay off the the poll. Starting to get responses in. We'll give it another 10 seconds or so. Another five seconds. Looks like most people who wanted to vote had a chance to vote. I'm going to share these results. Uh, looks like the majority of the people who answered, and it looks like there was about uh, 20 four or so people uh, answered. Um, adaptation seemed to be the, you know, the, the most popular uh, option, stay the course uh, second and then reinvention and, and wait it out. Uh, nobody exited, which is, which is great. So that's, uh, that's good. So I'm just gonna stop sharing these results and go back to uh, sharing my screen. So we were interested in understanding uh, why some entrepreneurs adapted by making the use of new technology while others did not. And it wasn't just economics. Most of the people who made new uses of digital technology, they created websites, online stores, increased their social media presence significantly, did so knowing that the costs might be higher than the financial benefits and that they realized that they might actually go back to the regular strategy once the crisis was over. I raised hand. Uh, oh, lowered hand. All right, I'll keep going for and then we'll, then we'll open it up to questions. So, so we thought that, there's, that the strategy might have something to do with their entrepreneurial mindset or their technology predispositions, but that actually wasn't it. It turned out to be more about their uh, identity or sense of self and how the COVID threat made people reevaluate their identity motives. Now, identity motives is a social psychology term for what's important to people, what's important to who they are, what's important to their sense of self. And in talking to people, we inferred challenges to their identity motives based on what they told us about their COVID experiences during the very early stages of the crisis. And some entrepreneurs told us about experiencing a crisis of confidence and how they were going to continue to operate. And in response, many adopted digital technologies to feel good about helping others in the community, thus enhancing their self-esteem. And others told us about having to close their stores and when operating their store was central to who they were. And so in response, many people, about many of those adopted digital technology to continue to feel more like themselves, to feel like they were continued to be an entrepreneur. Others 
its articulated feelings of a lost sense of purpose. And in response, many adopted digital technology to find personal meaning by being there for their customer. Others felt out of control to deal with the COVID situation. And in response, they adopted digital technology to get a sense of control back, that they were actually doing something and that they were doing all that they could do. And finally, others described um, feeling uh, increased obligation to their customers and employees. And so they adopted digital technologies to preserve the relationships that were important to their sense of self, particularly those customer relationships. So we think this is interesting for three reasons. One is it shed lights on why entrepreneurs responded differently to the COVID crisis and why entrepreneurs who previously had not used digital technology very much chose to do so at this time. Turns out their behaviors were very consistent with different identity motives. And from a practical point of view, I think this validates different strategies that we saw. Right? Some of the entrepreneurs we talked to were initially kind of reluctant to talk to us because they felt that we and others would um, you know, think negatively about their decision to close down and wait the crisis out. And our results indicate that this choice was perfectly reasonable as it was driven by motivations to balance and protect competing identities, being a parent, being a caregiver, other roles that people had. Although there are only, these are only preliminary results, they help to suggest that you know, if, if we want to be re more resilient for future crises, we should help entrepreneurs understand the influence of identity motives so that they can resolve these identity motive conflicts faster and make decisions faster. Many of the people we talked to reported being initially paralyzed um, by not knowing what to do. And you know, Jeff talked about this whole uncertainty at the time and you know, people really struggled with knowing what to do. So to help entrepreneurs adopt technology faster, educators and support organization really should be providing clarity on how technology enables the attainment of different kinds of identity aligned goals. Now there's an, an interesting initiative in Toronto called Digital Main Street. And they helped more than 3,000 entrepreneurs develop online stores and make better use of other digital technologies during the crisis. And I think they have plans to expand across the country if they get funding. But I think we need to think of other ways to mobilize the assist, assistance to entrepreneurs and business owners quickly during a crisis. And one idea might be to fund UVic, Roll Roads, and Camosun students to provide free or low cost consulting services to greater Victoria small businesses. So the infrastructure and the systems are in place to be able to ramp up quickly to help during a crisis. Now you may have other ideas to share with us and can do so in the, uh, the Q&A and uh, I'm going to stop sharing my screen uh, here and, and open things up to questions for either Jeff or myself. Jeff, looks like there's one in the uh, Q&A that you might want to address. What percentage of businesses have closed permanently since March in downtown Victoria? What's your projection for business closures over the next 12 months if foot traffic maintains at its current level? You know, that, and that's, a, that's a, a question I get asked a lot. And, you know, there's, there's a couple of factors in trying to determine that. The first is that the extension of the wage subsidy program by the federal government is really one of those pillars that's propping up um, a lot of uh, storefront businesses right now in terms of uh, retail and food and beverage uh, because it helps to make up the lost revenue uh, by being able to staff up, keep your doors open uh, and generate enough top line revenue to sort of ultimately uh, make it through. I think there's going to be a couple of, of uh, sectors though that are going to be more challenged even with the continuation of some of these programs. The first is the tourism sector in general. Uh, many of the, uh, we have 17 hotels within our boundaries and many of them are larger hotels and have either uh, large cash reserves just because they've been around for a long time or um, they are part of uh, international reservation systems that uh, uh, make sure that they capture as much of any business that might arrive as possible and that, will keep them sort of going. But if you're a whale watching company, uh, if you are a uh, tour bus company, if you are a retailer that primarily sells merchandise uh, focused on uh, tourists from outside the Pacific Northwest, 
um, even wage subsidy programs alone may not be sufficient because you're simply not generating any revenues. And so liquidity becomes a real challenge. You simply have no cash in the bank. And uh, how long do you continue to bleed money uh, in the hopes of coming up with a phase four, you know, we've got a vaccine, we've got an effective treatment. Is that 2021? Is that 2022? So uh, I think we will see some of those businesses disappear over the next six months uh, if we don't get to that uh, situation. And even if a vaccine's, you know, uh, proven, uh, distributing it, getting it uh, out in the broader uh, community, even across Canada or the United States will take months. So I think you're gonna see some of those types of businesses and retail storefronts potentially close. Uh, we're certainly doing everything we can to help to promote them and they're doing everything they can but at the end of the day, they rely on a large group of people who simply aren't coming right now. Uh, I think the other sector that is potentially at risk are those uh, smaller restaurants uh, that are primarily breakfast, lunch trade, coffee, muffin trade, that again rely on a lot of people coming in making $8 or $9 purchases from the offices. Um, and they, they're not, they don't have a dinner crowd. They're not destination restaurants. Uh, a place like Il Terrazzo, people come downtown to go to that restaurant. So they will continue to do okay. Uh, but if you're the place that somebody pops out to grab a taco for your lunch, uh, I think they're gonna be, again, struggling much more to stay on. I, I hate to sort of say it's gonna be 10% or 30%, um, but those are two sectors that I think uh, are gonna be under increasing pressure. What I would say finally is September anecdotally, I don't have sales data, but the September uh, for most of our storefronts was better than what they anticipated. Uh, so that along with the extension of the wage subsidy, I think many businesses uh, will now say, okay, let's hang on and see what the holiday shopping season is like. Let's see if people are coming out and, and making the effort to shop and have a dinner and uh, and I think we will perhaps see some businesses that are going to stay open uh, and then reevaluate again in January. So I know that doesn't give you the exact answer. Um, and I think it's the uncertainty that, that everybody feels. But there will be businesses that close. There's businesses that have already closed. So I would certainly say that our retail vacancy rate uh, on January 1st will be several percentage points higher than it is today. Thanks, Jeff. Um, there's a, there's a uh, comment in the, the chat with, you know, you and I, Jeff, we were kind of focusing on some of the real challenges of the COVID crisis, but in the, in the chat, it you'll know, acknowledge that there were some unexpected benefits such as better work life balance. And I know in my situation, you know, I got university age uh, children home for a while that we weren't expecting to, you know, to have home. So, so there were some underlying benefits. Um, you know, from the from the downtown businesses point of view, were, were there any silver linings here? Were there, were there was there anything positive? Well, I think you know, um, for anybody that was doing plexiglass manufacturing, yes, I think they've had a pretty good time. There, there certainly were a few uh, businesses that I think um, pivoted very quickly uh, and had very loyal customers to begin with, and so by placing a greater emphasis on online, actually reach new markets within the region, new customers. Uh, and so I think that was uh, sort of a positive and surprising. Um, I think that for um, some of our restaurants that, again, primarily did um, lunch trade, uh, but were able and had a product that they could switch quickly to, to delivery, online ordering and delivering, uh, and an example I have is uh, right next to our office is Island Poke on um, uh, Douglas Street. Uh, they were primarily a lunch trade. Well, they've actually greatly increased their dinner trade through the delivery and takeout option. And so they have found new customers uh, as a result. Their overall revenues are down, but they will actually probably keep many of those customers once we're through all of this. Um, and for sure, the, the comment uh, about the good uh, work-life balance, um, I think is certainly true for, for many people. 
I think the jury is out though on whether or not people who are working at their kitchen table or their nook table um, are going to want to be doing that five years from now. Um, you know, certainly people work for all sorts of reasons beyond the paycheck, uh, socialization, sense of purpose, structure. Um, that the longer people think working from home will be a panacea, I think we will see things evolve in a way that people don't expect. Uh, and so I think, you know, when I talk to property management companies in downtown, they are not getting a lot of sublet uh, and sublease requests for class A or class B office space, partially because many of their clients are government, uh, but also because I think that even if some people remain working from home post COVID, your square footage per employee for those that return is going to have to be bigger in order to be future pandemic proof. So, you know, I think what things are going to look like longer term, you know, the jury is still out. Um, but, you know, for most of our businesses, uh, even the surprises have been the surprise that kept their doors open, not the surprise that has made them have an extra big draw on their salary this year. Great. Thanks, Joe. Uh, in the Q&A, uh, there's a, a question that maybe it kind of reflects the idea that, you know, there were different COVID experiences and, and some businesses, you know, have, have, you know, maybe survived better than, than others and some are more challenged than others. And the question really is, is what do you need the most from the business community? I mean, if there, if there are businesses there that are, are able to help, Jeff, what, what do you need to help with, with the other businesses that are really struggling? Well, I think there's a couple of things. Uh, you know, the first is that for um, you know private sector offices, we are seeing a greater proportion of those employees coming back. Um, what we would like to see, though, is from you know the the law offices, the accounting offices, insurance offices, uh, the tech sector, is again really making those extra purposeful uh, shopping and, and daily decisions around how their employees can who perhaps been working nonstop all the way through this, how they can help those businesses. You know, one of the things, Brock, that, that is, is critical is when the uh, pandemic hit, most of my members, you know, the small and medium sized businesses, were, were not worried about them as business owners. They were really worried about their employees who are, you know, in this, in this part of the world, you know, with the cost of living and transportation, are one or two paychecks away from from being homeless and so you know it's it's businesses recognizing that the person who cuts your hair the person who does your your latte uh the person who serves that cold beer at the drake they need that job just just to pay their rent so we need businesses to promote downtown to their employees um the other thing is the tech sector has actually really stepped up and provided support to small businesses to get online, to get your, your uh, pay system set up so that people can do web ordering. And I think more of that kind of collaboration is going to be critical. Um, and, and I think what we've seen and what we, we, we need to continue to see is that as a commercial area, um, it's less about competition now and more about supporting each other. So supporting businesses, storefronts on the block. You know, can we do a cleanup on our street to make the block look good? Can I share a post of your business, Brock, and you share a post of my business to our customer base? Uh, the more people uh, I draw to my store is going to benefit you, Brock, because you're two doors down. So I think, you know, the collaboration that we're seeing, we're going to need uh, more of from the business community that has been less impacted from a revenue perspective to help support those storefront businesses that have been more impacted in terms of revenue. Great. Um, Jeff, in the, um, in the chat, there's just a question about, uh, I think you identified or your, your, your estimate was 65% of, you know, occupancy needs to happen in order to support those, you know, lunch crowd businesses. And it's, it, it, that's just your, is that a, just your estimate or is there some, no, there's, there's, I, I wish there was some great algorithm that came up with that. Um, the reality is that, it, that in this current climate to suggest that uh, everyone should come back to their office is not practical. Um, but, uh, you know, certainly if we doubled or slightly more than doubled every day, the people in their offices, that would be enough, I think, to keep most businesses again. So we're talking survival. We're not talking, you know, thriving. We're talking surviving. But 
you know, if on any given day, 65% of office workers were back in, that would be enough to keep most businesses going. Um, again, until we get to this, you know, phase four where we've got a, a vaccine or an effective cure. Um, and again, the public sector in particular, um, you know, uh, the government's so, so sh such great leadership throughout this, uh, that this is one area that we would like them to show the same leadership. I mean, the fact is that, that you know, and, and I, I'm being a bit facetious, but uh, I feel very passionate about this, that, you know, if you've been able to go to Thrifty's from day one and, and buy your Rice Krispies, you've been able to go to the garden store from day one to buy your bedding plants, surely you can sit in your office as a finance analyst in the Ministry of Forests. You know, that, uh, you know, yes, there's certain areas like elevators that have to be managed, but but in Victoria, uh, many of our office buildings are one tenant, the ministry of fill in the blank. So we have the capability of managing that far easier than other commercial areas. And so, you know, that's my real hope that the provincial government shows the same leadership here and, and models how to do it properly um, so that our businesses, uh, not only here, but the Selkirk Waterway and, and others um, can get enough business to, to keep their staff working and survive uh, over the winter. A couple of uh, other comments in the chat, one of which I can respond to. It asked, do I have a percent by category on the research slide that I presented in terms of people who exited versus uh, you know, adapted or whatever? And I, I don't because the research that we're doing, uh, we're, we're interviewing people based on kind of a snowballing technique where you know, we talked to, to an entrepreneur and then they introduce us to somebody that they know who either had a similar or different experience. So I don't actually know what percentage of you know, Victoria businesses fell into each of those categories, although it would be interesting to, to know that. There's another one that says they haven't heard much uh, chatter about future risks of pandemics. What's your sense of businesses need to future proof from pandemics? Um, you know, I've done quite a lot of reading on you know, research about, about past crises and shocks and you know, all the other terms that, you know, that we use for it. And, the, the sense that I get from, from the academic literature is that we should be getting ourselves prepared for the next one. And, and you know, we saw the financial crisis in 2008 and the dot-com, you know, crash, you know, 2001 and, and, and others. What, may, what we may see in the future may be more environmental, that, you know, as we see, you know, big weather events and, and, and other, uh, you know, big, big impact environmental uh, you know, crises. Um, you know, I, I think that we are, we, we do need to think about the future that, you know, we do need to start thinking about resiliency and what we can do to, you know, anticipate, you know, these events that could happen and, and put systems in place to try to mitigate their impacts. Um, a couple of other questions in the, in the, the Q&A. Um, Jeff, uh, due to the pandemic, there is much less appeal for new businesses to have any reliance on brick and mortar locations and foot traffic. What type of businesses, i.e. professional services, do you see filling the new storefront vacancies downtown? Well, that, that's a great question. And, and I'm actually gonna challenge the premise of the question a little bit because the, the death of retail, uh, I think has been you know, a, a topic du jour for some years now. Uh, and what I would say is uh, the, uh, and I don't know if that generation Y or the generation that was, had this in the, in, in the, in the cradle, um, actually do their shopping on, on their phone, but they do their purchasing in the bricks and mortar. Uh, the shift has been to experiential uh, retail, exper experiential dining. Uh, and, and so what I think you will see is it won't be a matter of uh, retail space being empty and only a professional service coming in. I think you will see retail that is more designed to, to be a hybrid between the online experience and coming in and still actually handling the purchase that you, you have, especially in things like clothing. Uh, and in fact, you know, the, the example I always use is uh, if you go down to the States and you walk in some malls, uh, you will find an Amazon store there. That in fact, uh, bricks and mortar presence is still important. Uh, what you may see, though, is a store that had, uh, you know, a thousand square meters as a retail outlet uh, may look to take a space that has 650 square meters, um, be more of this hybrid between the shopping online, but actually completing the transaction uh, 
uh, or you will see a combination of experience in retail in the same location. Uh, you know, chapters uh, started that some years back where you would go to Starbucks, you get your coffee after you bought your book or vice versa. Um, also, you know, from what I'm hearing from the property management companies in town, there are still inquiries for downtown locations. Uh, you know, we still have lots of construction on the books, both uh, uh, strata and rental in downtown that will need uh, services to support them. Uh, the DVBA and the city will be working on a um, retail strategy though, because I think, you know, there needs to be more purposeful curating of that retail space to better match the needs of the neighborhood so that you rely less on tourists or people coming from other parts of the region in order to support your businesses. That's the weakness we've seen right now is too many businesses need those cruise ships. And if we get another pandemic, no cruise ships come, um, that will be a challenge. Thanks. Uh, a couple of other questions here. Apart from survival, to what extent has there been noticeable interest or action in repurposing? Um, haven't, I think it's, it's still too early. Uh, I think for, for most businesses, um, again, their, their pivot has really been creating an online presence. Um, many of them have not been in the position because of the timing of this to actually, you know, change their inventory mix yet. So I think you may see more of that as uh, businesses are right now doing their winter purchasing. And you may see some of them, uh, you know, looking to shift their inventory. Uh, I'll give a prime example, a uh, uh, business in downtown that primarily did gifts and, you know, birthday cards and fun stuff like that. When the pandemic hit, uh, they pivoted and bought literally thousands of puzzles because that's what people were wanting. Um, they were able to do that. And I think what you'll find is that some of the businesses that sold widgets might now sell yo-yos because uh, that's more of what people are wanting. Uh, it will be a longer term impact on things like food and beverage to see if we see some new innovation, um, you know, in terms of moving away from things like buffet style restaurants, which are not COVID friendly, um, permanent patio space, uh, rooftop patios, uh, where you have an outdoor space that can be used most of the year that becomes more pandemic proof um, I think we're a little early in for that, um, but certainly there are businesses that are either looking at that or, or people looking for space to bring that in when the space becomes available. Um, there's one question in the Q&A that relates, I think, also to a comment in the chat. The comment in the chat is kind of about the, you know, the cost of parking downtown and the, and the question in the in the q a was kind of about the homeless population but combined these things are you know they're, they're you know both of these things work to discourage people from you know locals from coming downtown and i guess the question is you know around um you know are there any plans to address one or both of those issues to try to attract more people downtown sure well let me let me take the parking one first uh and uh you know first of all find me downtown where parking isn't an irritant and uh <laughs> I mean, that's just the reality in almost all downtowns. Um, one of the challenges with parking, though, is that, that, you know, people always say, well, you know, paying for parking is a deterrent. Well, when Sunday parking was free and Saturday parking was pay parking, every restaurant I asked and every retailer I asked, I said, which is your busier day, Saturday or Sunday? And every single one of them said, oh, Saturday by a, by a huge margin. So... I simply don't hold to the theory that paying for parking is actually a deterrent for people. People might not like it, but the reality is, is that, you know, when pay parking is in place, that's when our businesses are busy. The second challenge is that on Sundays, uh, on street parking, uh, the, it was mostly employees and business owners themselves that would park or people who'd had a couple of pops too many on Saturday night who did not need to come back until Monday at 9 a.m. to get their car, that occupied those spots. So street parking actually became worse on Sundays because those cars never circulated. So, you know, we work with the city very carefully and they have tremendous data on the cycling of parking and turnover and churn rates. 
uh, and we monitor that very carefully. But we think right now the city has a, a relatively good sweet spot of not too expensive. We're right in the mid range in Canada in terms of price, but we get a reasonable amount of turnover uh, on the street parking. On the far more um, detrimental issue, quite frankly, for downtown right now is the issue of uh, homelessness, uh, street disorder. Uh, you know, for, for participants, I'm actually also the coalition co-chair for the Greater Victoria Coalition and Homelessness with the mayor. Uh, and I spent 13 years in the Ministry of Human Resources a couple of chapters back. So I've been involved on this issue you know, most of my professional life. Um, and what I would suggest is that the population that we're talking about aren't actually homeless as much as they are currently unhousable because of very complex mental health and addictions issues. We've made it very clear that downtown is not an appropriate place for encampments because there are no facilities here and the impact is so immediate. The, the encampment at Centennial Square was right across the street from a hotel. Well, guess how that worked for the hotel. Um, you know, the, the whole idea of harm reduction was part of a four pillars approach that included prevention, treatment, harm reduction, and enforcement. Uh, and in the downtown, we're not seeing three of those four pillars. So we feel that in order to support the businesses, the city has to be very attentive to the needs of businesses, their employees, and the public. And the public's making it very clear that if there are homeless encampments in downtown, they're staying away. Uh, and that, that uh, cannot happen. Our businesses will not survive. We need people coming into downtown. It's a very complicated issue, uh, but uh, we think that uh, council in particular needs to rebalance between the needs of the 1,500 businesses in downtown and 250 campers uh, who are living uh, in the perimeters of downtown. Uh, and we also need to make sure that uh, people are held accountable for their actions. We may understand why they're committing some of those actions. Doesn't change the impact of those actions. Jeff, earlier you talked about the, um, you know, the the impact of CERB, you know, making it so it was hard for for some businesses to find or, or rehire employees because they were making more on CERB than they were, you know, working minimum wage in, in their jobs. Um, what's the situation now that CERB has ended and they're kind of transitioning to this new EI thing? Is is it looking up? Is it or has it changed at all? Um, I think it, we, I haven't heard that it's really changed anything at this point. I mean, the reality is, is that uh, uh, if I'm an employer and I asked Bob to come back three times or Carol to come back three times and they, you know, said no, I've hired somebody else now. Uh, and I think what we're going to find, uh, you know, this is one of these cascading things where I don't think uh, the data yet shows what's really going to happen for the unemployment rate, especially among youth. Uh, newer Canadians um, and people re-entering the workforce is for those that thought the, the CERB thing was going to work because we've always had such a strong employment market here. Um, I think there's going to be significant unemployment. Uh, of course, the way they collected the data, if you were on CERB, you weren't actually unemployed. So I think the data is going to be quite shocking uh, in terms of the number of people who will not be hired back because there isn't either the volume or the business to begin with. Um, what I think we will see, though, uh, is uh, with some people back in university now and taking their courses, my, my daughter included, uh, their availability is less. And so every September you see this switch in terms of who makes up your labor force uh, into the winter, um, and that may stabilize a bit. Um, the rental assistance program, though, continues to be a real challenge if businesses haven't had the revenue and haven't been getting support for their rent that may ultimately be the thing that tips them into insolvency um, and, and closing up their, their doors because that's a major factor of production for, for many businesses. Great. What do you need from the city to help support the DVBA? What specific adjustments or recommendations would you have for the city to help support our downtown core and our local business owners? Sure. Uh, well, you know, uh, you know, the city has done a lot of things, as I mentioned in my presentation, that were very good. The Bring Build Back Victoria program uh, in general was very successful. Uh, what, what, I would, what I would say from the, we need from the city is to recognize that 47% of uh, the city's revenue comes from uh, the commercial tax base. 
So worrying about a $35 permit, permit fee for a sandwich board um, or these types of things really uh, get in the way of businesses trying to be innovative, flexible, uh, energetic. Um, so we really need to de de remove the bureaucracy uh, in terms of how businesses operate, um, I'd say in the long term, but certainly in the short term. Um, and in particular, if in fact expanded patios are allowed to continue through the winter, I mean, there will be, when you winterize these things, they'll, they'll need to have some building code requirements, some fire code requirements. Those are provincial legislation and they're about safety. So nobody has argument. But if my ability to winterize my business includes putting an awning against a, a heritage building and the city says, well, you have to go to heritage design advisory panel, you have to do this, you have to, uh, those types of things the city can actually, you know, um, put a moratorium on. Uh, they can stop collecting fees for these things. And that's one area that they can help. If business comes and says, this is what you can do to help me, the answer should be, we're going to get to yes. Not all, all these processes that we have to follow. They're your own process. On the other side is the enforcement side. Uh, we've seen a tremendous increase in break and enter, smash and grabs in the downtown core, even uh, prior to uh, COVID. Uh, we need enforcement. At the end of the day, our businesses, you know, need to have, um, you know, bylaw enforcement, uh, police enforcement to reduce this criminal activity. Every time a business has to pay a thousand bucks deductible to replace the front window, that's a thousand, you know, if you're selling uh, runners uh, at a store on Laura Johnson, you got to sell a lot of runners to pay that thousand dollars. If you're only operating at 55%, Again, that's the difference between maybe having two staff people working that month. So we need enforcement to be brought back in to balance what's happening in our downtown core. It's still very safe for people, but our businesses have been negatively impacted. And quite frankly, the city needs to be focused on, on their needs uh, and recognizing the impacts are, are devastating for a lot of our small and medium-sized businesses. Uh -oh a theme that's kind of reflected in some of the, the Q and A is, is that, you know, when you and I, Jeff had talked a little bit about, you know, the idea that, you know, this COVID experience has been different depending on where you are and, and you know, you know, in the city, on the island, in the province, you know, Vancouver Island, you know, has had a relatively, you know, less impactful COVID experience from a health perspective. Um, you know, and, and yet, you know, it's kind of a one size fits all, you know, requirements from, from different levels of government. Uh, what's your take on the likelihood of, you know, Vancouver Island or Greater Victoria kind of being able to convince, you know, authorities to open things up a bit more here than maybe in, in Vancouver where they're having more of a challenge? Uh, that's an excellent question. And, you know, certainly we and others have called on, and really primarily it's the provincial health officer who, you know, they've done such a wonderful job. So, this isn't a criticism of the work, but it's a recognition. Uh, and it really came to light, uh, Brock, when, when uh, Dr. Bon Henry ordered banquet halls closed, nightclubs essentially closed, and liquor sales to stop at 10 o'clock for restaurants, um, that um, the, the province-wide approach really didn't make a lot of sense in merit to have to close the Legion at 10 o'clock when they have no cases. And we felt the same here that I know that Dr. Bonnie Henry has said we're all in this together and that I think has been a very successful strategy, you know, up to now. But in terms of the economics, as opposed to the health consideration, regionalization, I think, needs to be uh, looked at. And again, this is where I think the provincial government, which is again, stood back and allowed you know, the health evidence to drive things, which has been appropriate, now needs to step back in a little bit and say we have to start to balance the health evidence and health realities with some of the economic realities. There are many regions of this province that have had no COVID and yet they're operating um, you know, as if they're in the middle of the pandemic and active cases. We, we've been advocating for a regional approach. Uh, Vancouver Island is an island uh, and our success is uh, due in part because of people being compliant and in part because we're an island. Are there any other questions out there? We probably have time for one or two more. Uh, 
Uh, there's a question here that uh, relates to um, uh, would the city, specifically retailers, benefit from more uh, residential housing in the downtown core? Uh, absolutely, uh, and and I think certainly the mayor has identified that we've we've uh, been advocating. Certainly, I've been here three years uh, for a continued um, uh, push towards you know density in the downtown core. It's where it's appropriate, yeah. and um, an appropriate mix of housing. I mean, if it's all condos with people like me living in it. Uh, doesn't really help. You then have all the businesses catering to one group or that group is impacted. You have a, you have a disastrous uh, effect. Uh, we need um, certainly, uh, you know, stratas are fine, but we need rental housing. Uh, we need worker housing. We need housing that's designed for people who work in uh, the coffee shop, you know, so that the barista uh, and a roommate can afford to live downtown and walk to work uh, just like the urban professionals do. Uh, and we need an appropriate mix of social housing, uh, non-market housing. Uh, and we, we need to recognize that as you create that as a residential neighborhood combined with the commercial, uh, that an appropriate retail mix um, should be looked at. I know that the city um, is prepared to look at that. And I think the city has some tools for how you curate that uh, to work with property owners to perhaps not maximize the square footage in terms of dollars, but maximize the square footage in terms of having stable uh, businesses. And I, and I say this lovingly, but as a new development, mixed use development happens, we don't necessarily need to have another coffee shop and nail salon there. Perhaps dedicated childcare space or other things helps again to you know, diversify your local economy and support the people who would move into downtown um, and have that urban core lifestyle. Yeah, we only got a couple of minutes to finish up. Maybe you could just kind of close by reflecting on, are there any kind of, opt do you have any optimism or, or hope that we're going to be able to pull through and, and, uh, and, and have many of our downtown businesses survive and ultimately thrive? I, I do. And, you know, uh, in several areas. The first is that, you know, our largest uh, uh, economic driver in downtown is, is actually the tech sector which has by and large been pandemic proof. Uh, again, many people may have been working from home, but in terms of their innovation and the work they're doing, they've kind of carried on. Um, you know, people have heard me say that we have one of the be best mid-sized downtowns in North America. And one of the real reasons for that is over the last five years, the evolution of the entrepreneurs that have come into downtown and created unique boutiques and barbershops and restaurants, um, you know, uh, they've generated a real loyal local following. And so I do believe that um, if Greater Victorians continue to make those purposeful decisions, do their Christmas shopping early, if they don't know what they want to get their particular you know, kid or spouse or whatever, buy a gift card from a local business, we can get through this. Um, obviously, you know, the more we can, uh, localize our responses to the pandemic and regionalize some of those responses, the better it will probably be for places like Victoria um, so that we can lessen the impact in relation to places that are having outbreaks. I do believe that, you know, there will be a vaccine or an effective treatment that will allow us to move to phase four. Um, and I think enough people have really understood the importance of shopping local that that will continue on after. Uh, and so our businesses will, will thrive once we get past the pandemic because people will have gotten used to looking online locally first before they go to Amazon or, or wherever. Um, and you know we are, a, we are a caring community in Greater Victoria. And so I think you know, people are gonna make that extra effort. And our entrepreneurs are, are working their tails off uh, to create experiences that, that reward that loyalty. Fabulous. Thanks so much, Jeff, and thank you all for joining us today, and uh, hope you got something out of the, uh, the, uh, the workshop. Uh, if you have any questions for, for Jeff or myself, our emails are posted in the chat, and we would uh, love to hear from you.